Okay, um, uh, first of all, I'd like to start off with uh, the que a question. Who here has done FT8? Okay, how many people have done other digital modes of, of, radio, of ham radio? Okay, so you guys, when I go astray, you are here to set me right, okay? So, so let's start off with, uh, with uh, what is FT8? FT8 is a digital mode of, uh, of ham radio. It means no talking, no Morse code. It's, uh, it's done digitally. Computers will be involved. It's one of several digital modes that was created or co-created by Joe Taylor, a ham radio, uh, ham radio licensee who also happens to just sort of have collected a Nobel Prize along the way, okay? Uh, it was actually co-created with him and, and Steve Frank. Uh, it typically uses HF, but it's got capabilities that extend up into VHF and even microwave. So this means that even technicians can use FT8. It, you don't have to have a general class license in order to, in order to do that. Um, it uses the upper side band of the frequencies that it uses, even, uh, even the ones where normally you would use the lower side band. Uh, it works with very weak signals, okay? The idea of, uh, of this is to, is to be able to work with, with signals that are marginal. So even when the, when the ionosphere is just horrible for everything else, FT8 should work fairly well. Uh, this is, if you are into rag chewing, if you feel that if you haven't spent 10 minutes talking to each person that you contacted, this is not the mode for you, okay? The messages are short. Uh, typically, we're talking uh, a, a given message will be at most 22 characters long, more typically more than about 13 characters. Okay, we're talking individual messages are short. And each individual message is going to take 15 seconds to send. So, what would a typical exchange look like with FT8? Okay, with FT8, I might start off by saying CQ. I want to talk to somebody. My call sign, and then this is my grid square. Okay, FM08 is right in this, uh, in this area. So I've, I've given them that I want to talk, my call sign, and I've given them my location uh, approximately. I would expect then somebody to respond with something like this. If, uh, if Mike was responding to me, he'd be saying, John, this is Mike. Here's my grid square. In this case here, since we're close together, I'm guessing, Mike, that your grid square might be the same. But uh, OK. The, uh, so we've now established some communication. Next step is I would then send a message, Mike, this is John, your signal was, had a signal strength of minus 5 dB. Mike would then respond with, John, this is Mike, I received your signal with a strength of 10. Then I would send a message back to Mike that said, Mike, I'm John, I received your message, 73. Now optionally here, I could have just said RRR, which would just mean I've received your message. So now I, he knows that I've received his signal strength report. And then he sends a 73, acknowledging that he saw my RRR, or that my RR 73. If I had sent an RRR, once I saw that, I'd send another thing that said 73 there. But that's what a typical exchange looks like. Now, why this is interesting is that in this case here, all of these are, are nice and local. I'm talking to Mike. But I could be talking to somebody any place else in the world, okay? This is, is, is great for sort of doing DXing. Uh, one of the things about it is that we've only got 15 seconds to send every transmission. And it takes 13 seconds to actually do the sending. 
So that gives you a whole two seconds to, does anybody think that you can type in something like that in two seconds and get it right? Not, not, pretty much not a prayer. So what, the, what it does is it actually auto-sequences. The, the, the program actually automates your responses. So once you've sent the CQ, when somebody sends the response, your machine automat your computer automatically responds to them without you having to do anything. Now you do have control so that you can click to customize messages. If you want to, yeah, you can take control and type it in. But in two seconds, that would just sort of be really hard to do. So, the, so that's why it does the, the automated sequencing. Um, the, um, the software that we use is, uh, is called WSJTX. And that's Weak Signal Software from Joe Taylor Experimental. Okay, that's, that's what WSJTX stands for. It runs on anything. It's only, FT8 is only one of a bunch of different modes that the WSJTX software supports. So you've got things like, uh, uh, how many people here have run uh, JT4? Probably, I didn't think anybody had. JT9? Okay, I see, two, see a couple hands out there. JT65, okay. QRA 64. Nope. ISCAT? Nope. MSK 144. Okay, we're, we've dropped out. And uh, Whisper. <coughs> okay, so I see some hands on that. Um, and then there's all, even one, one mode specifically designed for detecting your own signal as bounced off the moon. Okay, so this is, so WSJTX. Uh, the, the MSK-144 is great for doing meteor scatter. This is where you wait for meteors to hit the ionosphere so that you got something to, something to hit up there. Uh, the uh, uh, JT-64, uh, JT-4, and QRA-54 are good for Earth, Moon, Earth. So if you want to start communicating via bouncing radio signals off the, off the Earth, off the moon, those are things there. Um, and they can do that uh, even in microwave. And uh, FT8 is the, is the most popular by far. And I credit that to the fact that most of these ones up here, you saw that it took 15 seconds to send each one of those messages. Well, most of these other modes send a message that's the same length, but they take a full minute to do it. So in other words, you hit send, a minute later it sent CQ, KK4JP, FM08, okay? The, now, you might say to yourself, well, well, how the heck can it take that long? And the answer is it's because it's a weak signal mode. It needs to send it with lots of additional information to make it so that you can, uh, um, so that even if the signal fades in and out, you're going to still be able to get your message through. But FT8 is sort of a modification that works in 15 seconds. So you can do a whole uh, a QSO in about, uh, in maybe a, a little over a minute, whereas with, uh, with JT64, you're going to, or JT65, I might have a typo there. JT65, it's going to take you probably four minutes, four or five minutes to do the same, same QSO. Um, what does the software look like? Okay, this is the WSJTX software, and I'll start you off with a nice sort of visible version of it. What you're seeing here is we are tuned in on, on one frequency. In this case, it was on 30 meters. And what we see is a spectrum that is divided up into little blocks. Each one of those blocks is, is about 50 hertz. And so, in the, in, the, in the same bandwidth that you would normally have a voice transmission, you know, to about two and a half kilohertz, we have all of these messages going on at once. So what we have, uh, the, the horizontal lines here represent each one of those 15 second chunks. So this might be somebody calling CQ, waiting for an answer, CQ, waiting for an answer, CQ, waiting for an answer. In this case here, that's a very strong signal. 
There's other ones here that are very weak signals. That's still a quite usable signal layer. Uh, there are, of course, controls on here that you can slide up and down in order to make it so that this display is more or less contrasty depending on, on the way you like to sort of see your, your signal displays. Down at the bottom of it, there's a, a, a graph that basically looks at the cumulative signal strength over time so that you can see that on this frequency there's been, uh, there's been something there uh, and, and so forth. Now, there's a, the two most important things on there I have not pointed out yet. Has anybody spotted them? Has anybody spotted them? <laughs> okay. Basically, the, the red is going to be your transmit frequency, and the green is going to be your, uh, and I'm hoping that's green because I'm colorblind. That could be yellow. I don't know. <laughs> green is, uh, is going to be the receive frequency. So that's the frequency that you're focusing on. Now, the truth be told, you're really set on one radio frequency. Really what this is showing you is, is what you're hearing, you know, what the audio is. And, uh, and uh, so even though I might be listening particularly to one frequency, I'm actually monitoring all of these at once. So that's the, the, this is what the waterfall display looks like. And this, of course, moves down over time as, as we get more signals in. Uh, yeah? Uh, it's the case that <clears throat> your transmit and receive audio frequencies don't necessarily have to Right, yes, no, and we'll, we'll actually see a demo okay. uh, of, of that problem, yeah. And there's a, yeah, that's a reason that there isn't just one of these. The, it's because you could actually change, you can leave your receive frequency on one and change your transmit frequency to another. And often <coughs> that's actually a recommended thing to do, to basically do sort of a split operation there. So here's what the, the other piece of the, the software looks like. Two windows come up on the screen. <coughs> And this window here is going to show all of the messages that are flying along across that whole spectrum that we were monitoring. So on the, on the previous one, when we saw there's, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different things going on, all ten of those messages are going to be decoded and they're going to show up in this section. If I had been listening on a particular frequency, those messages would show up over here. Okay, right now I don't have any of the messages there, and you'll sort of see some pop up as, as we do it. Um, the other, uh, the, down here would be where we would select the band we're on. Here we're on 40 meters, so there are some frequencies that are typically used for FT8, and the WSJTX program knows what they are. Uh, 40 meters actually right now is so popular that there's actually two of them for 40 meters and, and two for 20 meters because things were just getting too crazy on just the, the one. I mean, it would be solid stuff on your waterfall display. Uh, there's a little thing that tells you what your received signal level is. Uh, now, what's going on with the messages here? What's, what's all that about? Let's take, take a, a close-up look at that. One of the things about FT8 is time is very important. If, you're, if the clock on your computer is two seconds off, this screen will remain blank forever because it will never decode anything. Okay? It, it needs to be synchronized pretty precisely. So. What it's got here is here's our, our, our time in UTC. So 23 hours, 27 minutes, 45 seconds. The signal strength of that one was minus 12 dB. The difference in time was minus zero, meaning that it, it basically we were pretty much synced up exactly on our time. They were a little bit behind me, but, but so little that we can't even count it. Here's the, the audio frequency. So on our, our waterfall <coughs> display, that one would be showing up sort of right in this range here, sort of around 500. 
around 500. And then the message that they sent was CQ and then their grid square. And you notice that they're color coded. If it's a CQ, it's going to color code it for you automatically. So you know that somebody's, uh, that somebody's doing a call. Uh, they're also, once you have sort of selected a CQ to respond to, it's actually going to give you their call sign. It's going to say what grid square they're in, and it's actually going to read out for you how many kilometers it is. It's going to actually do the calculation as to just how far away is it and at what angle is it. We have controls here for sort of automating some of the things. We can turn that auto sequencing I talked about on and off here. We can also decide that if we want to transmit on one frequency and just stay on that frequency, we can lock that in as the hold frequency. <laughs> and then we can go and we can, these are buttons that we can use to fire off particular messages. <laughs> so that's what it looks like on your screen. And this is what it looks like in action. Have is our waterfall display creeping down, and I'm listening on this frequency, and my transmit frequency is offset a little bit. You can see all of the messages being decoded as they come in. I hit the erase button to clear this out because I'm going to start to do something. And, uh, and what's going to happen is that somebody's going to come up with a CQ. Uh, and I'm going to make it so, let's see, this is making it so it only shows the CQs. This is the one here. So here's one where I turned it on. I still need to get some, some things done. It's tell, warning me about the fact I need to use the new version of the software. I start to see some, uh, some things coming down here. I've got the, I've got, I can see something about how strong the signals are down here, but I can also just look at the colors up there to see them. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, this is, and it's also giving you the information on the propagation conditions as well. Uh, and so basically we can see that something's going on here at about, uh, around, about eight, uh, 800 hertz. And so there's the one at, uh, so this is, so KOVM is the one that's got that strong signal up there. That's, uh, that's happening. Now, then what uh, would then happen is that I have now clicked on one of the CQs and I've hit the button that says enable transmit. And down here, it's got the message that I'm sending FM08 to, to VE1JS. <clears throat> And I'm sending it back to him on the same, on the same audio frequency that, I, that he, he originally sent it on. So if you were shifting his software yeah. automatically. Well, and one of the things that noticed that what happened is it decoded a message that says he's talking to somebody else. Immediately, it turned off my transmitter, OK? Because I don't want to interfere with their, uh, with their, with their conversation. So it's going to automatically. <coughs> go and do that. Now, once they have then finished their conversation, I can hit my uh, enable button. And now I'm, now I'm transmitting again. Sort of odd, because he saw me trying to contact somebody else. And then he all of a sudden contacted me without me actually sending CQ. So what happened is, over here, what's going to show up is the frequency that you're listening to, where your little bar is, and it's also going to be looking for your call sign. So if somebody sends you a message on a different frequency, it's still going to show up. Because well, it, it's within because it's within this bandwidth there. It's up on the page there. Because uh, I had actually been trying to contact somebody else. Then he came back to me, and so then I said, OK, well, I'll, con I'll contact you and, and uh, try to send back. He wasn't listening as well as I would have liked, because as you can see, I'm, I've had, had 
some problems connecting to them. That's not unusual. Sometimes your message doesn't go through the first time. This is ham radio. Challenge is what we live for. Um, so, what the, so what's happening here is that uh, uh, we're a little dis discombobulated here. So what I've done is I've gone back to sending him my location. He's now sent me back the received thing. Uh, and he'd already gotten my signal report. He's now sent. He sent me that, so I'm sending him back that I've received it and, uh, and sending him a 73. And you can work. It will, and, then, and yes, and you can. And what it will do is, um, once you've uh, once you've got finally gotten everything through, you can hit the button to hit log, and then it automatically pops up a window where you can you can do the logging. And the newer version has better tools for connecting directly to some of the logging software. Nor the older version just saved a file that you could then import into your into your standard logging software. Um, but it's, uh, let's see, I'll jump this ahead a little bit here. Um, let's see. And by the way, when we're hearing quiet there, that's because I'm transmitting, <laughs> okay? Normally you hear that, and the noise, uh, and if you want to, of course, you can turn your volume right down there. Um, let's see. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll show you some, uh, some more of these in a second, but let me, uh, <coughs> say again? Oh. Yeah, yeah, no, the, yeah, some of them get, get a little, uh, get a little carried away there. Let's see. So. Is the audio that we're hearing, is that, that's all the messages all at once? Yeah, that's all the messages all at once. So you're hearing them all, all jumbled together there. Uh, fortunately, the computer can separate them apart. Now. How do we make this work? Let's see, well, let me, let's put it on slideshow mode so that you don't, I got all these nice animations and they're not doing me a darn bit of good if I show them to you all first. Okay, so, the question is how do you hook things up to make this work? Well, we've got a radio, must have a radio. We've got a computer running the WSJTX software, must have a computer running the WSJTX software, but how are we going to hook them together? And the way we hook them together is with a, a digital audio adapter. Okay, this is something that's going to take audio from the computer and it's then going to go into the microphone or digital input. Similarly, it's also going to be taking what's coming out the speaker of the radio, sending it to the adapter, and then sending it on to the, on to the computer. Uh, optionally, you can also have rig control, okay? We can also have a cable that, that allows us to run software that will, so that when we say change the frequency, it will change the frequency on our radio automatically. Don't have to have that. You can also do the same thing using Vox, uh, voice, uh, voice activation. Um, what do the magic red boxes look like? Okay, there's a, a wide variety of them. Uh, here is, the, is mine, okay? This one happens to have a, uh, a place for a USB port to hook up that connects to my computer. And then in this case here, this supports two different rigs. So I've got a switch on the front to select between them, and it's just a plug that goes into the digital input on my, on my rig. Optionally, it could be a plug that connected up to the microphone input on my rig if I don't have a digital input on my rig. So I'll let sort of pass yeah, that over. Some of the newer rigs like they yeah. Damon has, you, could you bypass Yeah, it, uh, some of them are going to have some. Uh, Dave, can you come talk about whether or not yours has that built in, with, or do you need, still need the box? Oh, uh, <coughs> uh, for, for AHF, I use uh, ICOMP 7100, which is uh, the uh, <coughs> modern version of the ICOMP 706. And ICOMP, uh, quite a while back, went to uh, have, having having the radio be the sound card. So all I need between the computer and the radio is one USB cable. And that supports the cat control for, for the frequency and the band changes and moves the audio back and forth between, takes the digital audio from the computer 
But, uh, but you can even, uh, Kim was nice enough to show me on Saturday at Panera her new acquisition that basically on this end it's got plugs where you can plug in the stereo output from your, uh, from your stereo input and output from your uh, computer goes in here and then it's got a plug that goes around that plugs into your Kenwood microphone jack on a Baofeng radio. So yes, you can do it with an HT. However, you probably don't want to do that because I don't think FT8 works on FM, okay? So, so uh, nonetheless, I'm just meaning for all rates. There are, by the way, the other thing also about this is the same type of box or connector is the same box that's going to let you do WinLink. It's the same box that's going to let you do PSK31. It's the same box that's going to allow you to do a large number of, of different digital things. Now, some of them are real simple. In principle, all you need to have is essentially an optical isolator in here to, to keep from getting sort of a bad currents running through your system. But there's something to be said for having one that actually has some dials on the front there. One of the reasons for that is how many people here have ever turned on their computer and had it make a sound? Well, just imagine if your computer came up and made that sound while you had it hooked up to this box and you're hooked up to the radio and suddenly FT8 is hearing the Windows startup noise. <laughs> okay, people are not going to like you so much. So, also it's really easy to accidentally forget what volume setting you had on your, or your computer. So, you want to have it. It's nice to have a dial that you can look at and you can say, yes, it's set to the right, to the right volume there. But these boxes here sort of tend to run in the maybe $100, $150 range, something like that. And these ones basically, what they are is essentially a, a, a computer sound card hooked up with a USB connector and then, and then with ports that, are de, that may be designed to hook up to specific kinds of radios. Not rocket science. They're, they're actually pretty easy to use and, and, and sort of handy. Um, in terms of configuring the, uh, the WSJTX software, it is not, uh, not difficult. What we have here is uh, a, ge a general tab, and so we're going to put in our call sign, our, 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 the grid where we're located. Uh, if we, if we can go over the radio tab, we can tell it what kind of rig we've got. That enables the rig control, what baud rate we're going to use, all of the stuff that you always have to tell things when they go and do the, do the rig control. Uh, again, if you want to control your rig yourself, you, can, you can, don't need this. The big issue tends to be whether you need to operate box or something like that because there has to be some way to key things. And an easy way to key things is to basically have the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the push to talk be using the computer, the, the uh, rig control. Um, but you can also, it will also do box. You can also set it up to use different lines on your serial port to do it. Lots of options there, but the default ones are probably going to work pretty well for you. Oh, John. Yeah. Go back. This one thing that's very helpful on the, on the bottom right there is test cat, test push to talk. When, you, when you're setting up, if, if you want to run cat control for the rig, when you hit that test cap, you've got it set up correctly, the radio will change and then it'll go back. So you know you've established contact with the radio. Test push to talk, it'll, it'll trigger the radio into, into transmit. So those, that's very handy when you're, when you're trying to suss out the, just what you need in the way of connection to be able to see that it actually works. Let's see, uh, the, the, I've shown you that, I've shown you that. Oh, here is where you select what the audio is. In this case here, I've said that the audio device I want to use is that little box that connects up with a USB cable. And so it's not going to be trying to use the speakers on my, on my laptop to do things. And like I say, it's nice to have something where you can have a stable, you have stable knowledge of what how loud you have the volume turned up on transmit. 
because as we all know, if you turn the volume up too high, you start to over deviate, you start to splatter, you tend to put stuff out over the spectrum that you don't want to be responsible for. So, and I will uh, uh, credit Dave on this, is when in doubt, start with a low volume le audio level and then if you want, you can try turning it up and, and, and basically look at what the transmit power of your rig is. And when it's getting up to the area where you said, OK, I want to do 50 watts, and it's getting up to maybe 30 or 40 watts, you can say, OK, I know I'm, I'm still under deviating there. I'm on the good side of things. I'm not going to be sort of, uh, sort of putting out too strong a signal and, and causing problems. Do I have that sort of right, Dave and Mike? Uh, I was going to say, the, the other thing, if you've got a rig that has, that will show you uh, the status of the ALC, the right. automatic limiter, uh, that's even better. What you're shooting for uh, when you're running digital modes, no matter what the digital mode is, the ALC circuit should never kick in. You that's never that want level to control is good for. You can keep that level of control down to where your ALC doesn't. Yeah, right. right. So you want to, if you've got an ALC display, uh, look at that. Increase your audio just until the ALC kicks in and then back it off, and, and you should be modulating just perfectly at that point. When you see those, you know, bright red down the middle and, and then splatting out across the hundred, yeah. 200, or even the most egregious examples have sidebands all across the, the whole two and a half kilohertz band pass. Those are folks who just have the audio cranked up full. Yep. They uh, never, never turn your audio up to 11. <laughs> uh, under the hood, what's happening here is basically FT8 is sending, uh, sending 77 bits of data per message. Okay, well hold on, I said there you could send messages up to 22 characters in length. Well, uh, normally you'd figure 8 by 8 bits per byte. Uh, that this, should, this isn't even enough to give you 10 bytes worth of data but we're sending messages that are longer than that. And the answer is it uses a very aggressive compression. Compression to the point that it actually takes into account that call signs look a certain way. You know, you, you need to worry about 26 letters for the first letter at a call sign, but somewhere in there there's going to be a number and you only need to worry about 10 letters there, so you don't need as many bits of data to, to deal with it. Very, very optimized thing. What it does is it's, uh, those are encoded into eight tones in 6.25 hertz steps, which gives you a total bandwidth of 50 hertz. So everything's fitting into 50 hertz there. Uh, now, what makes it weak signal mode? None of this stuff would make it weak signal mode. What makes it weak signal mode is the fact that it's got 14 bits for a, a checksum, a, a redundancy check that makes sure that if a message is bad, you know it's bad, plus 83 different parity bits that allow you to actually go back. And if something is messed up in these 77 bits here, you have enough information in those 83 bits to fix most of the problems. And so it uses that to... Um, to, uh, to do it. And if you look here, you can actually sort of see the eight different things coming down there and, uh, and, uh, and being on. Um, uh, now, one of the things that the, the latest version of, um, of, of WSJT or of FT8 version 2 is it went from 72 to 77 bits. They threw in five extra bits to make it so that it works on contesting and for work with de-expeditions. De-expeditions, for those of you who might be new or where hams go to some remote part of the world and operate and try to contact as many people as they can in a short period of time because everybody wants to talk to some island in the South Pacific because nobody's ever done that before. Um, the, uh, this, uh, there have also now support messages for, for field day and for other things. So typically on field day, we'd say CQ field day, your call sign, where you're at. W9XYZ replies to you and says that they, are, uh, they have six transmitters for a type A station in Wisconsin. 
You then reply to them that you received theirs, that you're a 2B station in eastern Massachusetts, and they say thanks, and you move on to the next contact. And then there's also the one for the, for the RIDI roundup there. The, the information that's required to be exchanged in each one of them is, is specified by the particular contest. Um, for de-expedition mode, they have a thing where you can actually set it up. You don't set it up on the normal FT8 frequencies. You use some different frequency. Uh, and it can handle up to 500 QSOs per hour. Uh, basically, what it does is it, uh, it can actually be, they would might be sending CQ during, uh, during, in the lower part of the frequency spectrum. So they're using uh, 300 to 900 to send their signal. Remember, we had up to 20, 0 to 2,500. So they're going to use 300 to 900 to send out their call saying, hey, I'm here then you're supposed to reply to them between 1,000 and 4,000. So what happens is they do a call out, and they have a special call sign here as a de-expedition station. And then all of these people reply to them. You've got to pile up. Everybody, the spectrum is filling up with all of these things coming down with messages. What will then happen is they will then pick the first one off the list, send back a signal report on that, you then send back a signal report to them. They thank you, and they get, and then they go on to the uh, on to the next station. Boom, 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 really fast, moving, 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 and they can actually support up to five uh, different uh, different uh, QSOs at once. Uh, you know, in that same two and a half kilohertz that we've been been talking about before. It's sort of amazing there. Is he an operator at all? Well, no, that's, that's just it. Is it almost doesn't need to, it almost doesn't need to have an operator. Certainly, when you're operating in de-expedition mode, uh, the operator probably is not going to be doing a whole whole heck of a lot. Uh, in the case of uh, in the case of doing it on yours, it's. Um, you do need an operator because sometimes things, somebody contacts you, just you didn't call CQ, they're contacting you. You need to switch this message. Something gets a little out of sync. You need to say, no, send this message, not that message you were going to send otherwise. Uh, you know, I'd like to say that it was just so automatic. It's like, oh, boom, you know, I see somebody, I click on their CQ, boom, my reply goes out, they come back. It can work that way. I've had it happen. But a lot of times what happens is that they, they don't work. One thing I, Dave made a, a mention of, and I was going to show it to you in that uh, slideshow that didn't run, and that was that typically on your, um, on your waterfall display here, what, uh, what a good strategy to do, see I'm close here, what a good strategy to do, and it's pretty hard to do on 40 meters because it's like this, is when you double click on somebody's CQ, both of these are going to move right over top of their frequency. But if you're smart, what you do is you then move to a frequency that nobody's using, someplace where there's an opening on the waterfall display. On 40 meters, hard to do. On 30 meters, not so hard to do. You move to that point, you hold down shift, and you click, and all of a sudden, the red one's over here. Now you're transmitting on a frequency that's clear of everybody else. And they can be replying to other people on their frequency, and you're not messing around with them. Your messages are still showing up on their screen. But they're not, you're not interfering with anybody. They know that you're there waiting for them to finish up their contact, and so they will then click and, and, and jump to you. So it's one of those things where lots of times you really do not want it to look like that. You want it to look so that the green bar is there and the red bar is there, somewhere where there's a gap. Like I say, on 40 meters, really hard to find. But uh, uh, when he comes back to, will he stay on his frequency? Yeah. Typically, he will, or he may say, "Boy, you got a better frequency than I do. I'm switching over." Is that automatic, or he has to come? Yeah. Well, the the thing that's nice is you see that anybody that is in 
this range, you know, in that range, all of the messages are being decoded. So if some message comes up with your call sign, by gosh, it's going to pop up over here, regardless of which of those uh, frequencies they happen to be on. Um, anyway, the, um, the, there, the documentation on this is really good. Uh, this is, there's a quick start guide for getting you started on, on, F, on, uh, w, on FT8. There's also a user's guide that goes into more detail on, on things. Uh, it, it, can, it will tell you about anything. The other thing also is that YouTube is alive with people that want to show you YouTubes there. So this, you can, if you want to learn this stuff and you want to do it, it's no problem. Uh, and, it is, and it is sort of fun. But there, are there any, any questions? Yeah. I've got a comment. Um, one thing that Mike told me, I was banging my head against the wall trying to get FT8 to work uh, between my Yesu and my computer. Uh, and um, having the time right on your PC is extremely critical. And I don't remember what that thing was you told me to use, but it's not a computation. Um, for, uh, if you're running a Linux machine, uh, it's just the standard time synchronization stuff that's going in. It's called NTP, Network Time Protocol. Uh, on that's Mac, what I, was I, don't, on I don't know what people use on Macs. On Windows, um, I use something uh, from a company called Meinberg, M-E-I-N-B-E-R-G. It's in Germany. And um, they do, they do high-end uh, time server stuff that, that the internet time servers use, but they also give away a free uh, Windows set package. And then there's a <coughs> dimension Anyway, I used, I, mentioned access I used access. Meinberg. I was using FTP. Yeah. And I thought, well, my time, my time is synced. <laughs> and I'm using FTP. And then he yeah. told me about Meinberg. I downloaded that, installed it. <clears throat> I instantly uh, connected and or started receiving signals. I was connected, but I wasn't decoding. Right. And uh, <coughs> instantly started decoding. And in the first 30 minutes, I talked to Russia, Czechoslovakia. I don't know, a couple of other Eastern Europeans in Ireland. It's, yeah. Woo! it's, it's like synchronizing the clock in your laptop or whatever. It's got to be exactly yeah. synchronized with the rest of the Yeah, universe. you need to be synchronized to sort of half a second. You, you, uh, could, or, <coughs> you can tell very roughly because the, the yeah, time awesome. bar on your window right. will s start showing green when you start hearing signals. And, and here's your 15 seconds going across there. If you're within part of a second, you're probably okay. But if you're more than a second off, you won't decode anything. And, and I, I, that happened to me. I so the mind just sort of runs in the background. Yeah, it's like NTP, yeah. like right. time okay. so it, it replaces the built-in Windows time synchronization, which is well, it runs all the time on the yeah. Which, yeah. You know, the, the built-in Windows time yeah. synchronization is good enough for timestamps on documents. But it's right. Not, <coughs> and then the... So uh, precise. And the reason this is important, so John yeah. sort of hinted at it, but uh, the transitions <coughs> don't just take, happen in 15 second windows. They happen on the quarter of a minute. And so everybody running the software knows that a transmission starts on 0, 15, 30, or 45. And, and the whole world. And so yeah. what the reason that's important is that they know that if it is three seconds after the top of the minute, we're decoding the call sign. We're not decoding a, a grid square or RR or 73. We're decoding the call sign. And at seven seconds past the hour, we're decoding the grid square. And, and that That's allows this compression to happen because everybody knows what to expect within a particular second. And so if you're off by a couple of seconds, uh, you're sending a call sign when the other station is expecting to be getting grid square, and so it works. That statement is that And true? if you're off, uh, I, should, I wanted to say, if you're not connected to the internet, you can use something like a USB GPS receiver 
to, the, to yeah. do your time synchronization, but you have to have time synchronization. Yeah, your cell phone will probably also work. I did, fi I did finally find the one I was looking for all along here. Uh, the, uh, what, it, what this was is, uh, here, I'll, I'll put, t put it back at the beginning and just sort of walk you through it quick. So what I've got is uh, somebody's going to pop up here with a, with a CQ. I click on that real quick, and then I go over here and hit Enable Transmit. i got to do it quick because, you see, I'm already starting to get into my 15-second window. i got to get there fast. So I've sent my, sent my thing. Uh, I, and and that should, the, this color is going to be mine. Uh, the other fellow, uh, in this case, it's somebody in Cuba. We're actually getting some interference. He's almost behind somebody else. He's a fairly weak, he's a moderately weak signal layer. He's, uh, his uh, signal strength is, uh, is minus 15. He's not exactly booming in, OK? He's sort of a marginal one there. So I tried to send back to him on that, and he's getting interference from me. So I've now moved my transmit over a little bit. Now I'm on a signal frequency where I've got the clear shot. There's nobody else there, at least that I can see. You know, on his end, he might have some interference there, but it, but you know, it's one of those things of where I'm not I'm not competing with somebody else there. So. Mine is continuing to transmit here, even if he had tried to make contact with other people. Since I'm not on that frequency, I'm OK. I'm not interfering. It then, uh, finally, he does now get back to me. Now, one of the things is that he's about a second off, uh, nine-tenths of a second off. So what's happened is that I've started to transmit this message that says, hey, I'm at this place. And then, uh, then mine has decoded his that's a second behind, and it goes, oh my gosh, that's the wrong message, and it immediately switches to the new one, just like that, uh, you know, within a fraction of a second. And that's why sometimes here you're going to see two of mine for one of his. Normally there would just be one back and forth, but it's, I'm getting just a slightly delayed little little exchange there. And so he's come back to me and said that I'm uh, minus 20. I told him that he's minus 10. He said RR 73. <coughs> I sent back 73. We're done. I can hit the, um, uh, I can hit the, the log QSO button and uh, stick it in the log and move on to the, to the next contact there. Like I say, not great for rag chewing, really nice for sort of DX. Uh, I think the furthest east I've got is Ukraine. I'm envious, uh, the, but I have gotten down to, to Argentina and, and that sort of thing. And you, on any day, you never know what's going to show up. So that's the fun of DX. Uh, Two questions, real quick. Okay. Um, this automatically uh, examines and calculates the signals, right? You don't have to get that. Yeah. No. It, it calculates it for you. Yeah. And the other question is: um, Are all of this in here? Um, in the same grid, the FM8? Yeah, well, the, 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 the FM08 probably, but the thing is that there's also, there are <coughs> details in terms of your grid square <laughs> okay. that go beyond that. I'm trying to remember, does QRZ automatically give you your grid square? Yes. If you, so if you go to QR, qrz.com and look up your, your call, call sign, sign it'll show your grid it typically. I think, I think actually in the options there, I mean, I think there may have been an auto grid. Yeah, yeah, there is a there is an auto grid. So it can it will actually go out to the database and, and pull out that information based on your address. John, if you were running some of the other digital modes like JT sixty five, is time precision also it's also important. Yes. The time precision is required for all of these. Thank you. And then I will Not refer. Like PSK and, and I bow before Mike as the expert on any of the JT modes. I've just done sort of the FT8 stuff. No, no, no. I haven't used FT8 very much. Um, I haven't done any DXing for, since I basically signed on to the satellite project. But um, I did a lot of JT65 and JT9. And uh, one, of the, one of the cool things about JT65, it takes up more than 50. Hertz, it's like 200 hertz or something yeah. like that. Uh, but uh, it can actually decode overlapping signals. So yep. you know, if you've got two stations that are transmitting overlapped uh, 
you can it can disentangle them and pull them out. And uh, I know JT65 and JT9, uh, the software can actually decode signals that you cannot hear. It can, you know, it, it can and JT65, which is the slowest of the bunch, can actually sort of dip down below the noise floor in some cases and, and dig out signals from below the noise floor. Yeah, it's pretty amazing yeah. stuff. And perfect timing, you know, <clears throat> at the bottom of the sunspot cycle, they have a mode that allows you to work the world. Um, yep. And I, I work about 100 countries on JT65, three watts. With a That's why, well, well, I, I, I'm going to brag for you that you contacted Antarctica on three watts and an antenna entirely in your attic. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's uh, that's that's sort of the the story on uh, on on FT8. So we uh, look forward to seeing your call signs pop up there.